it's unusual for me to be able to stand in front of an audience and have what is the, uh, a major part of my talks next to me in, in the flesh, as it were. Um, this watch, um, as Dennis Harmon uh, suggested, I think is important. And a central character in this story, I make no apologies for this, is John Harrison. Um, at Greenwich, we are very um, proud um, to be the custodians of John Harrison's three large marine timekeepers and the watch H4, which I will show you later on in the talk. Here is John Harrison, somewhat anachronistically, because in this portrait he's 74, he's holding what we call the Jeffreys watch, which I'll come back to. Now, if you've read Davis O'Bell's book, Longitude, you will know that he is a very unlikely candidate for a clockmaking solution. He comes from a family of cabinet makers. Now, John Harrison, it has often been said that he's self-taught. Now, at that time, there were plenty of books in, public a in circulation that described how you could do, um, how you could um, become a, you know, survey buildings and land. And it seems as though John Harrison was self-educated in this respect, probably reading books by the likes of William Leyburn. And at about the same time, we know that he was making clocks, which we call today H1. Um, and here it is, um, and it's an extraordinary clock. Nothing had ever been made like it. Um, and you can imagine when it was brought to London that it would have caused quite a sensation. And this caused the Board of Longitude to be convened for the first time. Now, what I haven't mentioned is, of course, that there was a significant reward in the air for anybody who could provide a practicable solution. In 1714, the Queen Anne Longitude Act was issued, offering a grand sum of £20,000 to anybody who could provide this useful method of <coughs> determining longitude to within half a degree. And there were lesser stages of reward money as well. Now, John Harrison at this stage realized that there were shortcomings in his marine timekeeper and perhaps that his initial testing of the timekeeper in the mouth of the River Humber had not, you know, he had greatly underestimated how bad conditions could get at sea. So the Board of Longitude agreed to advance him the sum of around 250 pounds to begin work on a second timekeeper and a promise of 250 pounds or thereabouts on completion. So within a very short space of time, under three years, John Harrison produces this machine, which we imaginatively call H2. H2 only took two and a half years to make John Harrison was working on this machine, trying to perfect it for a total of 19 years. So John Harrison was experiencing problems. So H3 was by no means a failure, but it just did not um, fulfill um, the ambition of you know, being a longitude solution. During this 19 year process, John Harrison turns his, um, his attention to what seemingly is the very obvious solution to the whole problem, a pocket watch. John Harrison commissioned a, a watchmaker, John Jeffries, to make some very subtle changes. And he found a staggering improvement in the stability of the watch as a timekeeper. So he then looked into improving the watch and developed this, which is the fourth timekeeper. Can anybody suggest what we call it today? <laughs> um, so this is really, uh, not only is it an extraordinarily beautiful thing to look at, but inside it is, it is a very sophisticated pocket watch. But what it isn't is, it is a U-turn from his original ideas. We're not looking at a miniaturization of the larger timekeepers. So we're not looking at perfection of an idea and miniaturization. We are looking at abandoning those ideas altogether and improving an existing technology. H4 requires oil. 
Um, its pivots run in dual bearings, but it has this much faster tick and it has a larger balance rim. And this gives the watch tremendous stability when compared to your average pocket watch. And this was trialed twice. The watch performs brilliantly. I mean, the watch only alters its timekeeping by 39 seconds over the whole period, which is truly remarkable and well within the, um, the rules of, of the Queen Anne Longitude Act. And, and here you get this um, perhaps justifiable sort of um, um, thinking of Harrison that he has achieved his goal and would like to be rewarded and carry on and enjoy the trappings of the longitude uh, reward. But that does not happen. Now, part of the um, condition of the Board of Longitude was that John Harrison disclosed his design, so he had to publish his design. And this is, a very, this is the front page of a very important edition of John Harrison's description of his timekeeper. And John Arnold has really engaged with John Harrison's methods and has gone a long way to understanding them. Now this is the Newport Historical Society Arnold Pocket Watch. Now, I saw this on the 7th of March when Ingrid very kindly brought it over to the Royal Observatory and I had the distinct pleasure of opening it up and dismantling it and examining the mechanism. And it really was quite an exciting moment for me. Um, outwardly, it looks like a very good quality gold, what we call a hunter um, pocket watch. When you get inside, well, there's, there's some history inscribed on the back. And here we've got Arnold 1765. Now, this is erroneous, but it's not the first time that I've seen misinformation engraved on the backs of timekeepers. In fact, we have Larkham Kendall's second timekeeper, K2, um, which was taken by the mutineers on the bounty. And that has a veritable essay inscribed on the back of it. And it is very, very inaccurate. <laughs> um, so this is, is quite, quite mild by comparison. The date of Arnold 1765 is wrong. I believe that this timekeeper was made at the same time as Royal Society No. 37 in 1772. The deep research has yet to come, but I'm going to give you a little flavour so here's the, the watch movement, um, and the first impression is that it's in really good condition. You, you can see it for yourselves here afterwards. Rather unadulterated. Now, these early timekeepers very often get changed, and this is no exception. It has been changed, but not hugely. Um, one thing that I really wanted to do was look behind this to make sure that we're not looking at John Old number 45 or such like. And so the dismantlement began. So taking the dial off, this is what you see. Um, very, very beautifully executed wheel work. Um, very, very, very high quality stuff. Um, it really is quite exciting um, to see this survive. And, and I mean, this has had a very, this has been very, very well cared for. Um, I, I suspect I haven't had a chance to research the marks on the gold case, but I suspect that the gold case was produced at the time of acquisition by the Clark family. Um, so it'll be quite interesting if we can find, if we can date the case. Um, but yeah, it, it's been very, very well looked after and it's had very few visits to bad, well, it's had no visits to bad watchmakers. <laughs> uh, <laughs>